As I said, it's a, uh, a real privilege to, uh, to have you here on this special day <coughs> and a very big welcome to all of you in this front corner. Uh, many of you have made a special trip to be here today. I'm very grateful for, uh, to many of you for, for coming. Uh, most of you have come from the south side. You've come from the land of Mordor, the dark side of, uh, of Brisbane. And now you've, that's right, the, uh, the Christian side apparently. <laughs> And now they've made their way over here to, to the light here on the, uh, on the north side of Brisbane. Amen. <laughs> Apparently, you're outnumbered here this morning for once. We are here in the light side on the north side of Brisbane. Now, if you don't know what I'm referencing when I speak about this land of Mordor, I'm speaking, of course, and referencing the Lord of the Rings. When I was a kid, the Lord of the Rings were being released one at a time, and uh, this was something that myself and my family were very, very into. It was one of the only movie series that me and my family chose to go and see the very first session of whenever these movies were released in the cinema. But after marrying my wife, Sarah, who you heard from this morning, one thing surprised me about uh, about her, which was that she uh, didn't have this same love of the Lord of the Rings that I had had growing up. Uh, She had never seen these movies, Lord of the Rings, before. And so when we got married, I thought this is something we need to rectify straight away. And so for nine hours, she joined me with these movies movies and unfortunately she didn't find the same amount of joy watching these movies as I found but I assured Sarah my wife that all we needed to do was watch it a second time (laughs) and she would really start to enjoy it and so about a year ago we sat down and we watched these movies again all nine hours of it it's wonderful Now, it had been a little while for me since I'd seen these movies myself, but there was something I noticed that I hadn't noticed before when I was watching these movies, and that's uh, that's because the pacing of these movies is actually quite rapid. These movies are based on three quite lengthy books, and they're trying to condense a whole heap of what has uh, happened in these books into three three three-hour movies. Now, after the success of the Lord of the Rings movies uh, after they came out, what Peter Jackson decided to do, the director, he decided to try and make a little bit more money off this uh, series and so they released the prequel to the Lord of the Rings which was The Hobbits. But the difference between the Lord of the Rings movies and the Hobbit movies was that rather than it being three fairly lengthy books spread between three movies and it's a very fast paced, suddenly he's trying to make one book into three three three-hour long movies. Now what you notice if you have watched either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, the pacing of these two things are very, very different. The Lord of the Rings, they race through these different movies, but then with The Hobbit there is a lot of filler and extra humour, there is uh, it's a lot slower in the pacing that it, uh, that it takes in these three three-hour long movies of, uh, of The Hobbit. This morning, we are going to be going through a, uh, a new series through the Gospel of Mark. And the pacing of this Gospel account is far more like the Lord of the Rings. It is very, very fast in the way that it goes through this gospel account uh, of Jesus' life. And sometimes the pacing can feel a little bit funny because it moves so fast. Now, part of the reason that this gospel account moves so quickly is because simply of what Uh, what this gospel account would have initially been written on. Uh, This would have been written on papyrus, which was a very expensive um, a very expensive thing, uh, material for anyone to use in ancient times. And so Mark is very, very careful in every single word that he shares about the life of Jesus and the detail that he chooses to include about Jesus. And this is also how we're going to be looking at this book of Mark. We're going to be going through this over 11 weeks 
quite rapidly. Now, for those of you who join with us regularly here at the church, you might look at a series that we're going to be doing over 11 weeks, and you might think that's a lot longer than most series that we would go through, but this is still more of a sprint through this book uh, that we'll be going through over these weeks. And so, can I encourage you, uh, if you are going to be joining with us over these 11 weeks, to go a little bit deeper into the book of Mark grab some life group material and go through this with your life group. But the other thing that you'll notice if you get one of these uh, bits of life group material is there is also a daily devotional that you can uh, go through over these 11 weeks. So please grab a copy of that. It's either in the foyer or it's on the website. The writer of this gospel account, it's often been accredited to this guy, John Mark, who is the person that this book is named after. This guy, John Mark, he was one of the companions of Paul through uh, many of the ministry journeys that Paul made throughout the world. He's referenced several times throughout the New Testament as Paul's companion. However, he never uh, credits himself throughout this gospel account. And that's because, as I said before, he's very specific with every single word he chooses to write, and the book is not about Mark. He is pointing to Jesus. Now, Mark writes with a very, very clear purpose in mind. Firstly, he's writing to Gentile people, not Jewish people. This means that there is less assumed knowledge of the Old Testament, and he writes to people explaining far more of the things that he's referencing from the Old Testament. Mark provides a lot of content, uh, context sorry, as he explains things that many Jewish people would have as assumed knowledge. Secondly, this gospel account is centred around the true nature of discipleship. Throughout this account, we'll see Jesus making an explicit call to people to come and follow him and in the ways of, uh, in the ways of his father. Throughout this year, we've had a focus as a church family on being a family with one another in the church. And although this is important for us to understand what it means to be family with one another, the way that our family here operates is very different from anything else in the world. Many of you might be part of sporting clubs or schools or interest groups or community groups, etc. And in many of these different areas, you may find a sense of belonging. But the church is something very unique from the rest of these things because the church isn't centered around an activity or an age group or a particular stage of life or interest, but it's centered around a person. The person is Jesus. And this person is supposed to be the, th the person who impacts the whole entirety of our being. And this is why we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. Mark is centred around Jesus, his life, death and resurrection, but unique from the other Gospels, it's also centred on the way that we are to disciple one another and teach one another more about Jesus, and we look to Jesus as the ultimate example on how to do that. Now, the way that the Gospel of Mark begins is very different from Matthew or Luke or John. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you see the Christmas narrative, and there are miracles presented that surround the, uh, the Christmas narrative of the birth of Jesus. Then in the Gospel of John, what you see is this big cosmic picture painted of who Jesus was. He was the Word became flesh. But the Gospel of Mark begins far more simply. It doesn't begin with miracles or grand language in the same way that these other Gospel accounts do, but it begins with the simple, kind of strange cousin of Jesus who is telling people about the Messiah who is about to come very soon and that the people need to get ready for this Messiah who is about to come. Strangely, Mark doesn't even include the Christmas story in his writings. Rather, what he chooses to do is start his gospel narrative from the point that Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry when he was about 30, uh, 30 years old. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the passage right now. We're going to be reading from uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. 
So let's read this together. It'll also be up there on the screen. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. If you're wondering, right there, this is a combination, these words of Malachi 3 verse 1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. It's a prophecy about, uh, about, who, was, about who it's speaking about. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message, after me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. A quick pause on what we've just been reading. The Jewish version of, of baptism uh, existed far before our understanding of baptism that many of us would, uh, would have here in the church. Um, what did it mean? For Jewish followers of what was called the Qumran, this was a sign of ritual cleansing and was part of their ritual repentance of sin. So this means that when Jesus was baptised to fulfil all righteousness, he was taking part in this Jewish tradition of what was necessary to receive cleansing of God through, uh, through baptism. Let's continue on. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. This is one of the clearest representations of the Trinity um, working together here in this moment. In this moment, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all working together in perfect unison with one another. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So here you have Mark's Gospel, which starts out with this radical Jewish preacher who is the cousin of Jesus appearing in the wilderness, telling everyone to repent of their sin and to turn towards God because the Messiah is about to come. This guy, John, he had clearly amassed a massive following despite some of his uh, eccentricities. He wore camel's hair as his clothes. He had a leather belt, which seems quite expensive for someone who wears camel's hair. Um, he ate primarily locusts and honey. Now, this is not the kind of guy who you would have initially thought would be the person who would be the main guy to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And yet, this is who God chooses. And he is given this amazing opportunity to be the person who baptizes Jesus himself. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And one of the other uh, places that you often go if you're going to Israel is going to, uh, to the Jordan River. Uh, there's a photo up here on the screen. I think, thank you so much, Barb. Um, and this is one of the, uh, the real privileges that most people get when they are able to go to, uh, to Israel. Uh, different people in our group, they chose to be baptised here in the Jordan River. And we did our typical way of baptising people that we do here in the West. We would grab someone and push them down. It's quite violent, it feels like, the way that we baptise people here. You push them down under the water and then you bring them back up. But one of the things I noticed when I was here at the Jordan River is there was a group of African people who were doing baptism very differently from what I had seen before. Um, they would 
uh, say a lot of the similar phrases that we might say. They might say something to the extent of, I now baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then they would begin bobbing up and down in the water. It's actually far less aggressive than the way that we do baptism here in, uh, in the West. Uh, now, we don't know what Jesus' baptism would have uh, been like and how it was done, but we know that this was an incredible way for Jesus to begin his ministry here in the Jordan River. You have heaven opening up, you have the Father proclaiming over the Son, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, and then you see the Spirit of God descending on Jesus. Now, there is a huge amount that we could look at throughout this passage, but for time's sake, I just want to look at one verse that informs the baptism of Jesus, but it also informs the whole rest of the book of Mark. And this one verse is verse 1. Verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God doesn't seem like there would be very much in this one verse, but here Mark is using a literary, a literary device called the uh, Incipid, uh, which is designed to be a, a summary of the whole rest of the book. And so what Mark is doing here is he is ensuring that if people only get this one page, if these are the only words that they are able to read of the Gospel of Mark, they know what everything else is all about. It's about Jesus the Messiah. He is the Son of God and he is sharing with them the best news in history. So you can sum up the entire Gospel of Mark in these few short words, which means that if you get these words you can understand all of the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Mark starts out by telling us that this is good news. In your version of the Bible, if you read the King James or English Standard Version, you may have the word written, Gospel. Or in the original language, there is this word presented, which is euangelion. Despite being the shortest of the four Gospels, Mark uses this term euangelion or gospel more than all of the other Gospels combined. Now, rather than being simply a recycled philosophy or set of doctrines um, that have been changed uh, throughout time, this was news that Mark was choosing to share with the rest of the world. Now, today this word gospel is used almost exclusively as a, uh, as a religious term. But in ancient times, this was a regular word that people used as part of their everyday speech. And rather than being a religious word, this was far more of a political word that was used uh, in the ancient world. The Roman Empire at the time, they would sometimes send out people to share a euangelion with the people in the empire when one of two things happened. Either there was a new emperor on the throne or a decisive battle had been won. And so you would have a messenger that would travel all around the empire and they would share a gospel, they would share a euangelion with people around the empire to help them understand this big news. A euangelion was like us uh, waking up after a new government has been put in power and us watching what the news results are on our uh, TV screens. And so for Mark to start his gospel in this way is a fairly bold claim because he is placing Jesus over the top of the Roman Emperor. But throughout church history, we have often taken this word gospel and tried to package the news about Jesus in an easy way, in an easy to understand way. The understanding of the gospel that many of us have within evangelicalism will often follow these key moments. Creation, we spoke about this last week, God created all things good and perfect and created humanity in His image. The fall, we have sinned and turned away from God causing separation 
Third thing, redemption. God came as Jesus and lived the perfect life that we are unable to live. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and he rose again on Easter victorious over sin and death and now offers us the opportunity of being reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. And the fourth thing, perfection. One day Jesus is coming again and he will put everything right. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus, you will experience eternal life with him. We spoke about this last week, and what I've just presented to you, these four different points, nothing is wrong with this. All of these things I just mentioned, they are all true. I have taught this myself in the past, and I will teach this again. The gospel is everything that I have just mentioned, but it is also so much more. To package it like this is something that Scripture never chooses to do itself. Rather, Mark says seven times throughout his Gospel account, everything throughout what I am writing to you, this whole thing I have written is the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, throughout this Gospel account, there are a few different parallel stories going on all at the same time that we see uh, initially presented here in, uh, in the first verse. When I sat down with Sarah to, uh, to watch Lord of the Rings, um, one of the things that was most confusing for Sarah was the number of stories that were going on all at the one time. In particular, in the second movie, in The Two Towers, there are three stories going on at once. There is one story where Merry and Pippin are trying to get the Ents, these giant trees, on side to take down Saruman the wizard. Then there's another story where Frodo, Sam and Gollum are making their way to Mordor on the south side of Brisbane and Mount Doom to destroy the One Ring. And then you have Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, a man, an elf, and a dwarf who are fighting with the, Rome, uh, the Rohans, uh, fighting with Rohan against these giant orc armies. Now, if everything that I said to you just sounds like a big nerd fest, it's true, and that's fine. Understanding Lord of the Rings doesn't mean that, uh, that you're unable to to understand the Gospel of Mark if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings. But here you see three parallel stories that are taking place throughout this one movie. And Mark has something similar happening with it uh, throughout this entire Gospel. There are three different stories that seem to be happening at once. In these three stories, there is the story of the Creator, there is a story of the Messiah, and there is a story of the Son of God. Firstly, the Creator. Mark makes allusions to creation all through his book, but he starts doing this in his very first words in this first verse. His first words right here is the beginning. Surprisingly, this is actually the same phrase which is used in the very first verse of the book of Genesis, of the entire Bible. What does this mean? This means that what Mark is trying to do is he is trying to identify Jesus with creation. He is going back to the first scriptures and showing a link between Jesus, who is walking the earth, and creation at the beginning. Later on in the passage that we just read, after Jesus is baptized, the Spirit comes upon him like a dove. And part of the reason this particular language is used is because there was a familiar Aramaic version of creation that Mark would have read, and the of uh, yeah that Mark would have read, and the way that this version reads is uh, is after the water was created, the spirit flapped his wings over the waters like a dove. Later on, we see the story of Jesus be linked once again with the creation narrative through him being tempted by the enemy. But the difference here from the creation narrative is that he doesn't give in to temptation, but he overcomes temptation through the Word of God. So here Mark is making a clear distinction that Jesus is linked to creation. He's the Creator God. His second story that we have going on through the book of Mark is that of Messiah. 
At this point in history, you have the Israelites who have been waiting anxiously for their Messiah to come. There was someone prophesied to come and redeem not just Israel, but the entire world. And here in the Incipid, Mark declares that the Messiah has now come. Jesus is the Messiah. There is no more waiting. The promised one has arrived. How does he demonstrate this? He does this through the following verses. He uses the following verses, which were prophecies of what would happen through, uh, through John making a way for the Messiah. And, so, and then you have the third parallel story that is going on, which is the story of the Son of God. Now, we might skip over the language at the end of this first verse that says the Son of God, because we read this often through, uh, through Scripture, but this is a bold statement for anyone to make throughout the, uh, throughout the first century. In the ancient world, um, people didn't use credit cards or banknotes. The primary way that commerce and, uh, and finance took place was through coins that were used across the Roman Empire. And on one side of the coins uh, in the Roman Empire, there was the face of Caesar, and on the other side of the coin that was uh, used as their primary uh, primary finance, was these words, Caesar, son of God. So for Mark to off open his gospel account by declaring Jesus to be the son of God, and he does this twice, he does this at the start and then again at Jesus' baptism, this wasn't just bold, this was a dangerous choice to make. It wasn't just dangerous for Mark to declare Jesus to be the Son of God, but it was dangerous for anyone who was speaking these words, because in doing so, you were declaring that it is Jesus who reigns, not Caesar. You were declaring Jesus is greater than the emperor. This was such a dangerous thing to believe at the time that it's estimated that there were not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of Christians executed in the world for declaring that Jesus was the Son of God. And considering that at this time, the global population was only about 60 to 70 million people, this is a huge portion of people in the world to have been executed due to believing that Jesus was the Son of God. So Mark's opening statement... He's in Kippard. He declares that Jesus was there at the creation. He was the creator. Jesus was the promised Messiah that had been promised to redeem the world. And Jesus was the only true one Son of God who reigns over all things and all kingdoms. Now, Jesus was all of these things. He was creator, Messiah, Son of God. And what I find really interesting is that in, amongst all of his greatness and power, his first act of public ministry is to be baptised. This is an act of humility. This is an act of submission to someone else. The one who had no sin, he chose to identify with sinners in his first public act. The Creator, Messiah, Son of God, chose humility, and he demonstrated this in his very first public ministry act in, uh, in history. So today, most of these things are probably things that you have already heard before. You'd be aware that Jesus is the Creator, that He's the Messiah, that He's the Son of God, and my goal isn't to give you any particular practical steps on how you might live your life differently after today. Rather, what my goal is today is that you will be stirred to worship Jesus once again in light of who He is. Yes, Jesus humbles himself and interacts with sinners, and we see Jesus interacting with people in a very simple, relational way throughout the rest of this Gospel of Mark. And yet, Mark makes a very strong case right at the start. Don't lose sight of who Jesus is. This is who he is. He is the Creator. 
He is the Messiah who was promised to come, and He is the Son of God. He is greater than Caesar. He is greater than any king. He is greater than any earthly kingdom. And so what we're going to do right now, we're going to sing a song just as the team comes up, and we're going to declare the reigning power of the Son of God, of King Jesus. We're going to declare that He reigns above all things, all nations, all kingdoms, all of heaven, all of creation. And so would you stand to your feet and let's have our hearts stirred in worship as we declare that he reigns above it all. And so King Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be able to sing to you, to be able to worship you and declare the truth of who you are. We acknowledge you as creator, the one who is over all things. We see so much of you revealed through the Old Testament, where you were prophesied about, where people spoke of this coming King who is going to come. So we acknowledge you as Messiah, but also King Jesus. We acknowledge you as Son of God, You are greater than any person who has ever come. You are greater than any person who ever will come. And yet you humbled yourself by coming to this earth. So right now, God, would you, in light of that, humble us, give us humble hearts as we begin to sing to you and as we begin to worship you. We want to have a real understanding of who we are singing to and who we are meeting with right now. In Jesus' name, amen.